Dean Heller from Nevada will make the formal introduction. John, thanks for hesitating there for a few minutes. <laughs> Didn't want to lose my moment here in the limelight and, and uh, certainly want to welcome everybody here on the panel, obviously everybody here in the audience. And I have to do this, everybody from Nevada. Uh, please stand up. <laughs> I'm so pleased, and I want to thank the chairman and the ranking members, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to introduce uh, Commander John Stroud today. He's been a friend of mine, and he's been a wonderful friend to my office. In fact, I have a poker chip here that he gave me in 2012 to prove it. Only in Nevada would you have a challenge coin in the form of a poker chip. Thank you, John. Um, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, very fitting uh, that John was chosen to be the Commander-in-Chief of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Since, his in since its inception in 1899, the VFW has served many different purposes for veterans. While it is known for advocating for veterans, a VFW post is also a place for members to foster friendship with others who served. In a state like Nevada, this solidarity among the veterans community truly rings true. And within this tight-knit Nevada veteran community, Commander John Stroud has been one of the most outspoken advocates. I cannot thank him enough for all that he's done from the start of his service in the U.S. military to today. Commander Stroud first began his military career in the U.S. Air Force, serving for 21 years, from 1976 to 1997. This service includes a tour in Korea with the 51st Fighter Wing at Osan Air Air Base, where he was a flight operations superintendent. During Commander Stroud's time in the military, he received four meritorious service medals, three Air Force Achievement Medals, the Korean Defense Service Medal, and the National Defense Service Medal. But like all the VFW members uh, we have here today, his service to our country and his fellow service members was not over after his 20 years. In 1996, Commander Stroud joined the VFW in Las Vegas and later Hawthorne, Nevada. Not only did he embrace the camaraderie of joining a post, but he also dedicated himself to serving the VFW in many leadership positions, including the Nevada Department Commander from 2006 to 2007. Commander Stroud has also served on numerous national committees, including chairman of the National Veterans Service Committee. He also is a Triple Crown All-American Commander Awards recipient. I also want to acknowledge an important person here today, the one who has to deal with the commander's difficult travel schedule, and that's his wife, Mary. Hi, Mary. Please stand. Thank you. <laughs> Mary's been a committed member of the VFW Ladies Auxiliary, also works to serve our nation's veterans. Thank you again, Commander Stroud, uh, for your service to our nation as, as a veteran and as Commander-in-Chief for the VFW. I look forward to your testimony uh, on how this committee and Congress can do better to serve our brave men and women who serve in our military. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Heller. Commander Stroud. Senator Heller, thank you for the kind introduction. Your commitment to veterans has not gone unnoticed by me or the VFW. <clears throat> Chairman Isaacson and Miller, Ranking members Blumenthal and Brown, members of the Senate and House Veterans Affairs Committee, thank you for holding this hearing. First, I want to congratulate Senators Isaacson and Blumenthal and Congresswoman Brown for their selections to leadership roles. I also want to welcome back Chairman Miller and the returning members of the committees, as well as congratulate all of the new members for their desire to serve our nation's veterans. While major troop withdrawals have occurred in Iraq and Afghanistan, America is still at war. The medical care and services they need must be there for them for their lifetime. To provide that care effectively, Congress must put a stop to the looming budget sequestration. There is no guarantee that VA will be exempt moving forward and defense and labor programs will be directly impacted by these cuts. To protect our military personnel, veterans, their families, and America's security from the harmful effects of across-the-board cuts, Congress must end sequestration. Congress must end sequestration.
your leadership and bipartisanship has proven to the nation that veterans are our prior a priority. Without your intense oversight, veterans would still be waiting on hidden wait lists. Oversight wasn't enough. Your committees and staff then worked tirelessly to pass the Comprehensive Choice Act, setting a new course for accountability and access. Along the way, you also passed advanced appropriations to ensure monthly veterans' disability and pension checks would continue should Congress shut down the government again. Already in this new Congress, you have passed the Clay Hunt Sav Act, providing resources to help turn the tide on veteran suicide. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Each year, in partnership with the independent budget, the VFW produces budget recommendations for VA's funding accounts. While VA's request comes close to reflecting the IB, several accounts fall short, including medical facilities, major and minor construction, and grants for extended care facilities. In April 2014, whistleblowers at the VA Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona, exposed rampant wrongdoing, most notably the manipulation of waiting lists. To learn exactly what occurred, the VFW had held two Veterans Town Hall meetings and surveyed our membership. What we heard was both alarming and disgraceful. From this feedback, we compiled a report, Hurry Up and Wait, where we outlined specific policy recommendations to fix the VA healthcare system and to hold its leaders accountable. In an effort to mitigate problems with the new choice program and to gauge the pulse of the veterans community, the VFW launched a web page where veterans could learn about the program. We also commissioned a direct survey where our members can provide feedback on their experiences with the CHOICE program. We then compiled an interim report on what we heard from more than 2,500 veterans. The full report has been submitted with our written testimony. Our members are concerned with the use of the straight line distance to determine eligibility and not being properly informed of the CHOICE program eligibility. Congress needs to amend the law by changing the CHOICE program's geographic eligibility from straight line distance to driving distance. Our second survey indicates that VA is making progress in implementing the new law. As of February 20th, more than 34% of survey participants who are eligible for CHOICE were afforded the opportunity to receive non-VA care, up from 19% at the end of our first survey. VA must continue to provide frontline personnel the training they need to ensure all veterans who are eligible for the CHOICE program are afforded the opportunity to participate. While 92% of survey participants felt that having a CHOICE was important, only 53% elected to receive non-VA care when given the option. This indicates that veterans who are presented with all available options make informed decisions that are best suited for their specific circumstances. Moving forward, VA must take lessons learned from this important program and apply them to its purchased care model. While the VFW believes veterans should be given a choice for care, specialized care services are unique to the VA must not be hastily outsourced to private sector healthcare providers. Veterans turn to VA for such care because it cannot be easily replicated in the private sector. The House passed HR 280 on Monday. This is the first step in improving accountability. We encourage the Senate to quickly pass this bill as well as both chambers passing HR 473 and HR 571. Congress must do everything it can to give the Secretary the authority to discipline and remove bad employees so the good work of the vast majority of VA employees 
can move, move out of the shadow of the bad actors. When Congress passed the Choice Act, a few members voted no. This is unacceptable, and those members heard, heard it loud and clear from their VFW members. We will continue to track voting records, and our membership will hold any member accountable if they don't make veteran funding, care, and benefits a priority. While a majority of the focus has been access and accountability, Congress cannot neglect other health care needs. The House showed its commitment earlier this week by passing H.R. 294, which will provide increased long-term care facility options for veterans. Thank you, and we look forward to its quick passage in the Senate. VA must be ready to provide the gender-pacific care that women veterans deserve. VA must also focus their research on the psychological and environmental effects war has on women veterans. Understanding the differences in causes, symptoms, and treatment modalities between male and female veterans will help prevent women veterans from going undiagnosed and untreated for serious conditions. When severely wounded, ill, or injured veterans seek fertility treatment, they're told VA services are very limited. Congress must correct this inequity and authorize VA to furnish infertility counseling and treatment for these veterans. <laughs> While the SAV Act took steps to improve access to mental health care, more must be done. Congress and VA must also find a way to provide health care to those veterans who have been discharged from the military under conditions other than honorable. It is not unusual for service members with mental health issues to go undiagnosed, get into some trouble after returning from war, and then be given an administrative discharge. These veterans deserve a second chance. <laughs> VA must continue to research the effects of T TBI on cognitive and behavioral function and develop treatment programs that show promise of bringing improved health and quality of life to affected veterans. Family caregivers who provide care to veterans who were severely disabled in the line of duty truly epitomize the concept of selfless service. Our nation owes these caregivers the support they need and deserve. It's time to grant caregivers benefits for veterans of all wars. <laughs> veterans who were exposed to toxins during their military service deserve to know if their health conditions are associated without exposure. Congress and VA must, must devote resources for research to better understand the health conditions associated with toxic exposures. <clears throat> We cannot allow veterans to continue to struggle. It's time that we provide them with the care and benefits they deserve. Over the past year, VA reduced the disability compensation and pension workload by nearly 134,000 claims. VA achieved this by shifting its focus from other work, such as appeals and dependency claims, thereby creating new backlogs in those areas. The VFW believes VA must properly staff regional offices and the Board of Veterans' Appeals, provide a better summary and analysis of evidence considered in deciding each claim, attach the rating narrative to each notice letter, and conduct an independent review of VA's quality assurance program to ensure accuracy in the claim's error rate. <clears throat> Over the past six months, representatives from the VSO community, VA, and Congress met frequently to explore ideas to improve appeals processing. These discussions have identified several ideas which could eliminate or mitigate some processing bottlenecks. The most promising of these ideas has been dubbed fully developed appeals. Under this initiative, 
claimants with no additional evidence to submit could elect an ex expedited appeal process, allowing them to receive a decision in a matter of months. This has the potential to be a win-win for veterans and the VA. However, in order for this program to work, veterans must be provided with an adequate decision notice so their due process rights are not violated. Over the past few years, the work of your committees has produced significant evolution in the way military prepares transitioning service members for civilian life. To continue this process, progress, Congress must continue to improve skills acquisition and transferability, access to higher education, paths to entrepreneurship, as well as bridging the civilian military divide. A primary concern for the VFW is the lack of accredited VSO involvement in the new TAP process. When service members leave the military, they must fully understand the benefits and services they are entitled to. Though not under the purview of your two committees, I would be remiss if I didn't comment on how important the POW MIA mission is to the VFW and our nation's veterans. The VFW supports the new joint POW MIA accounting agency, which merged the former DPMO and the joint POW MIA accounting command. Congress must fully fund this mission. <laughs> I want to again thank you for the opportunity to represent America's largest organization of war veterans, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.